Uh, I'd like to thank um, both Brenda and Matilda for their courage in standing and speaking to us. I think it takes tremendous uh, resources, personal resources, as well as spiritual resources to be able to do that. Thank you. And I also want to thank the Koselish Nation, on whose, I probably pronounced it all wrong, on whose um, you know, soil we, I am standing, and to Eva for the invitation, um, and to all the staff, especially Harjit, whom I really bugged a lot. Uh, because I wasn't clear what they wanted, they went back and forth on it, and then of course I know you had to postpone it. So, but thank you all. And, and finally, all of you, uh, I honor all of you, because all of you actually do the hard work I talk, which actually I'm very, I can talk a lot. Um, right now, actually, my voice is going to come and go. I've decided it took me all these years to get a sexy voice <laughs> like Lauren Bacall. So at some point in my life, I became sexy. Anyway, I actually have it here. Oh, oh you, won't, you, you don't want to do that. There's going to be a disaster of the first order. I'm very clumsy, so okay. Uh, and you'll be like, okay, that's a cultural thing too, trip things, okay. All right, so I want to start with this. Um, this is from a long poetry uh, by the Berbers. I don't know if you know who the Berbers are. They are a nomadic tribe that transverses what is today, uh, pretty much all of North Africa into what's the Middle East. They, today, of course, with all the national boundaries, it's much harder. So the, the, it's part of a much longer poem, but to me, these, these two lines make a tremendous amount of sense for the years of work that we've all done. So vast the prison crushing me, release, where will you come from? For those of us who've done advocacy work, whether that be local, or at the state, or whatever level. I mean, our journey has been to help break the bonds of prison that many women find themselves, which is their homes. But many times I have to wonder in the 30 years uh, plus that I've done this work, both in the US and elsewhere, whether we've actually done this or whether we have created more prisons for women in the kinds of ways in which our work has evolved. So it's, it's something to sort of keep in mind as we move forward. But in thinking about culture, uh, I am just going to sort of um, paraphrase the quote. Uh, you, you're going to get all of this, so don't bother writing things down. So any of you been to the old Royal Observatory in Greenwich? Not in the US, but in good old England. No, and you haven't really missed anything, but, but the reason I have this is that when you go to the old Royal Observatory, you have the observatory, the observatory is actually surrounded by a wall, and if you don't know this, you actually miss it. You kind of walk around the walls, at some point, you're going to come to this very sort of smooth gold band, actually it's marked on the pavement. This is the prime meridian or longitude zero. If you actually stand to the uh, left of that, you're technically in the Western Hemisphere. But if you cross it and just stand 100 yards to the right of it, you are no longer a European. You're actually an Oriental. You know, much of the ways in which we conceptualize the world and the ways in which we think about difference is based upon these very deep lines that we draw. You are here, I am here. Whatever I am, you are not. Whatever you are, I am not. That's how we kind of think about it. And what I would suggest to you as we move through this is that those lines are so deeply socialized in almost all of us that it's not that easy to get rid of. But our journey is to make them from the dark lines to more long dotted lines. Eventually, maybe when we pass this world, we may get rid of the lines. So the other thing I want to tell you is that when we think about competency, which is a word that actually comes out of healthcare, is very, very problematic in this line of work because you will never, ever become culturally competent. I finished doing this three-day training and everybody said, okay, so are we all culturally competent? I said, no, uh, you will be when you're dead, maybe. Uh, that didn't go over very well, but just wanted to tell you that. So, up front. So one of the reasons why should we even bother considering this thing called, that we call culture? It is because it actually shapes how a particular person experiences the world and actually experiences violence. It actually shapes somebody's 
response to any intervention. So when we're thinking about perpetrators, abusers, all of these are terms, offenders, you know, if you, if you don't understand where they come from, they are not going to take responsibility, neither is the intervention going to work. And we all know from everything I've heard today, yesterday, that it totally shapes the way in which people can access services. Services are absolutely not equal. And even if they are, the quality really varies because there are those who we may not like to serve. And I will keep it sort of gentle at this point. It'll change as we go through. I'm just warning you at a time. So, but you know, in, in, in sort of trying to figure out how culture operates, you know, a lot of times we go, okay, if only we knew the culture of the person in front of us, it would work. So let me ask you this. What is my culture? You can say whatever you feel like. I don't take offense. Canadian? I wish at this point I'm ready to. <laughs> Given the politics in the US of A. Ah. American? Thank you. <laughs> what else? South Asian? English? Oh, I don't think the English would really consider me to be English. They take one look at me and say, okay, that's where she belongs. Look, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's really funny because um, I was training a bunch of Georgia judges and I asked them this very same question and they said, you're a Yankee. <laughs> so I was like, yes. It took me 30 years of living in the U.S. to become American. It's like, okay, not bad. And they refused to go beyond that. I was like, oh, this is fun. Finally, I became. And actually, the evaluation said not bad for a Yankee. So, okay, here we go. Look, look, we live in an information age, right? At any point you want to figure out anything, all you have to do is do www.india.gov, india.com. You will get all the information you need to work with us those of us who look a certain way and dress a certain way and behave a certain way. It's actually very easy, or you do, you know, your cultural sensitivity training. How many of you do them, attend them? See? You know how they look. In, I, don't, I cannot speak for Canada, but I will speak for the U.S. It, this is what it looks like. You'll have four chairs, uh, depending upon where you are. One African-American, one Latino, one Asian. <laughs> The fourth is a question mark because it depends. It could be LBGTQ, it could be something else. It really varies. So you get a whole bunch of information, like sometimes it's a binder thick, and you go, okay, next time that Asian woman walks through, I can look and I can work. And plus you add now the internet and you, you have exactly what you need to work with. But you know, the trouble is that when you're trying to shape an outcome, it's not just about the person who's walking through your door. All of us have a culture, whether we care to admit it or not. The organizations we work in have a particular culture, which shapes the way you actually think. And then you have somebody in front of you. It's really how these three things come together that shapes the final outcome. The two things that are the hardest to deal with is who you are and where you work. It is a lot easier to deal with the person in front of you. And that's what we think. And, and so that's what we would also like to shift to see where it is that we are landing. So the question becomes, what is the seven letter word that we call culture? What is it? You can hazard a guess. It's the context. Beg your pardon? Universal. Universal, okay. Language. Beliefs. Beliefs. Values. Values. Language. Norms. <coughs> Language. Diverse. Diverse. Food. Food, of course. <laughs> the big thing, food. I remember doing this uh, presentation and everybody got, got, says food, food, food. And then they look at me and says, oh, I can't stand the smell of curry. Uh, that they were going to buy a house and the whole house smelled of curry. So I had to stand there smelling myself. Oh, gee, I may be smelling of curry too. Uh, uh, some people got the joke, other people didn't. But anyway, so yeah, food is a big one. You know, clothing is... Look, you know, it, it, what, what is fascinating is those of us who do this work for a living, 
this word actually is very controversial. And I have to tell you this, uh, and I have lots of stories. Sometimes I get sidetracked and I forget the ending of the story. So if I do, you have to tell me, hello, what happened in the end? Okay, you, you know, we had this, uh, the Social Science Research Council in the U.S. called a bunch of us to hash out what this thing was. Uh, it was in this very fancy resort, you know, where the chairs are more comfortable than your bed, uh, where you can actually sit there when you're bored, look at your own reflection, and fix your hair. You know, it, it's like I could have just lived there. Anyway, two days into this meeting, uh, we are ha the argument starts. I, I am not lying to you. When I say to you that one person actually got up from the chair, got on the table, went across, and was ready to strangle the other person. That's how challenging this is. Partly because there is a historical way in which we have received knowledge, and then that has been challenged. And I, so what I'm going to do to you right now is, you know, some of us who have PhDs think we know everything anyway. So uh, I am going to collapse for you sort of uh, centuries of history right now, but I'll do it very quickly. So this is how we have sort of understood culture, that it is this very stable pattern of thoughts, beliefs, values, all of these things that are handed down from one generation to the other so that the second generation can adapt to that particular environment. The trouble is that it is absolutely outdated. And the question becomes, why is it? So this is where I'm going to actually collapse history for you. Look, those of us who study cultures, have, there's a particular way in which you do it. Now, you, you know, historically, if you look at people who have traveled the world, you have to go back to BC. You know, Christ has nothing to do with it. It's way back. Um, because we always start with AD, but, you know, things happened even before that. That, you know, people have historically been always curious. Like, you know, why do people behave the way they do? Why do people treat the dead the way, you know, if you treat your dead a certain way, you raise your children a certain way. There is some established link between that. But we are always curious, why do people behave the way they do? I have to tell you something. I am going to be picking on you. Nothing personal. It's to make a point. If you feel offended, please see your therapist. Uh, make an appointment because <laughs> I really am not bothered by it. But, okay, so having said that, so we observe people, and you, what you probably don't, didn't realize is I've been sitting here, but I've also been observing you. So I've actually come to certain conclusions about all of you advocates who work in British Columbia. You may not want to know that because I'll publish my paper and get, you know, one step in the door. That's what we all, those of us with PhDs, do anyway. Uh, but, but the thing is, we, we are always curious. Like, you know, why is Bali sitting there in the middle of my talk peeling a banana? So I am like, okay, proper women ought not to behave this way, right? That's unladylike completely. So I am looking, or I'm trying to put a lot of significance into that behavior. Say, oh my God, people, advocates in British Columbia, you know, I'm, I'm going a certain way. So you actually, but observe people, and there are travelogues that write about this. But the very systematic study of why people do what they do was carried out by the British originally. I should not even say the British, actually the English. And what we have to understand historically is that much of this is actually connected to the opening of the ocean, ships, and the capacity to travel by ships. Because land travel is very, very hard because of mountains, rivers, and so on. So the English actually went out and studied people. And so how you study people is you observe people. You talk to people. You ask them, I could ask Bali, what in the world is wrong with you that you're eating a banana right now? <laughs> right now, some of us could go certain places, which I'm not going right now. Uh, other people will go, oh, poor thing is starving, therefore she's eating. You, you know, it, that, it's just human curiosity. But human curiosity ha also has problems. And the problem is the following. So. Okay. See? All right. I was looking at her, and I was just staring at her. I'm very curious, like, why is she sitting that way? So there may be 
peculiar something about Aboriginal women, you know, and you have Terry saying, you know, there's something is their heads are very heavy, so they have to kind of hold it. <laughs> right? But, but, when, when she saw me looking, if, now, if I actually, from an observation, it's, they're not the only ones, there are other, others of you sitting like that. So I could do that, and it's a legitimate observation. But the problem is, when she saw me observing her, she kind of shifted her position, and this is what most people do. <laughs> so, if I were to observe that and write it down, you would go, oh my God, you know, uh, advocates in British Columbia all just grin at you for no, absolutely no reason. <laughs> this is what the English did. They went, they studied people, and they wrote. The trouble is two things. When you're observing, I am the one who's observing, you are being observed, and the actual, there's a process of observation. The trouble is that when the person being observed understands you're observing them, it stops that behavior. So the question becomes, is the behavior true for all the people at all the time, or is it true for that individual at that particular time and space? Right, so th this is where it gets troublesome. The other part of it is, if you heard me carefully, I passed a judgment on her. Observation always is, it, it includes judgment. So actually now, when you go back and you look at stuff that was written, what they do is they actually tell you more about the people who are writing rather than the people who are being actually observed. The other part of the trouble is, essentially, this is the understanding of culture that leads to fundamental colonization of pretty much by the British, the French, and the Dutch of seven-eighths of the world. The English starting with the Irish and then moving to the rest of the world. This is why this definition is very, very problematic at many different levels. This is what starts the colonization of Aboriginal people, both in Canada and the US. In the US, it's followed by slavery, followed by right now what's happening with all the anti-immigrant sentiment. It fundamentally arises out of this. So what I'm gonna to suggest to you is this way of understanding culture is highly, prob is highly problematic. So then what are we left with? What we're left with is that it is about shared experiences or commonalities, but there's absolutely nothing stable about any culture. Culture is fluid, it changes fundamentally because of the ways in which the social, political, economic context change. And it's about all of these things happening at the same time. The other thing is that the older definition of culture actually considered only race and ethnicity to be cultural, nothing else. And the older definition then we can say, uh, definitely in the US, that you know all Asian women experience violence the same way. But the, Asia is half the world. I would love to, you know, I always remember this. It's, uh, I have tons of stories like that. You know, early on, my work was mostly uh, South Asian immigrant women. So I get this call from this person. Say, okay, can you just talk about South Asia? I'm like, yeah, no problem. It's a 15 minute on a panel. What can you can say anything and people will buy it anyway. So uh, then she says, okay, can you just go and, and talk a little bit about this way, go to Southeast Asia? I'm like, yeah, no problem. And they says, okay, if you can go this way, can you go just up north? Do Japan, you know, I was like, okay, you know, I am really flattered that you think I know all about China, Japan, Korea. And then it became all countries east of Turkey. I was like, you know, I'm completely, totally flattered, but it's not possible. Because that is what Asia is. And that's the trouble with the older definition, because you can create these large blocks and say, if it's true of two, it's true of all. And it's actually used with race and ethnicity. Number of things about this. These are all categories we human beings have created to try and understand what makes you different from me. Because look, th there's a, one strain of thought that goes, okay, we are all human beings, it's all blood, they are all the same. 
you know, that is crappy. My language will start to go downhill pretty rapidly, and I was just called on the carpet. You know, I'm from New York City. It's like, okay, we just use every word, uh, but I just got called on the carpet. And I, thank God, uh, I just said, shit, hell, damn. And I don't know what the fourth word was. I did, it was not the F word by any chance, because then it would have been really bad. And I was like, okay, language is very class-based. So I apologized to everybody, then gave it back when I got a chance. But, but the thing we have to understand, though, is that these all occur together. Yes, we see difference. To say that we don't see difference when you have eyesight is a lie. We see it. When you don't have eyesight, we do sense difference, but in a different way. And so to say that we don't acknowledge difference is very problematic. We have to acknowledge difference if you have to make a difference in the way we do our work. And the other thing is these things interconnect and intersect in different ways for different individuals at different times in different locations. So I cannot say that a an African-American woman in New York City experiences violence this way. It depends on her age, on her class, on her sexual orientation, whether she's able-bodied or not. All of that mix is what creates. I mean, I know that Janice yesterday talked a lot about intersectionality. Much of this analysis comes out of that, but intersectionality in its origins developed by Kimberly Crenshaw really looked only at race and gender, and then people have added on to that, pushing against the original received ways of looking at culture, because you cannot understand culture without understanding the structure of power and the history of oppression. These two things go together, because culture, the thing is culture is never, ever neutral. No information that you receive is neutral. It is given for a specific purpose and serves a specific purpose. So what becomes important is to understand the layers that make each one of us and a community. And that we are all exposed to like different ways in which we are vulnerable. And if you really have to work with somebody, you have to understand the totality of the ways in which oppression operates. It's not just gender oppression. And I'll tell you one sh little story. Um, and there was an African-American woman I was working with, and you know, by all the definitions, uh, you know, we all like to work with people who A, listen to us, and if you deny that, I will tell you it's, you're denying, I don't know why, but we all like people who, who listen to us and who profusely thank us. Okay? And uh, we don't like the ones who question us, say, what the hell are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. You know, somebody else can do it better, and you want to say, yeah, go there. Why are you coming to me? But, you know, but the reality is this woman did everything. I mean, she would do everything, and she did everything in her power to leave her abuser. The problem was she was an only child and was very close to her mother. But the mother really adored the ex-son-in-law. So every time she would move, you know, she'd call her mother. Next thing, the mother would call the ex-husband who would show up. This goes on finally. She decides that the best thing for her would be to get out of New York City. And, you know, the nice thing about working for the state is when people don't follow or don't listen to you, you say, okay, this is the state calling you. You have to do this. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen. That, that threat is the underlying ways in which you get stuff done. And we moved her. She was very happy, doing well. Her boys were really doing well. Eight or nine months later, um, I remember it was a Tuesday that she called me at 9.30. I cannot tell you which month, any date or anything like that. And she says, Sujata, I'm letting you know that I'm back in New York City. I said, what? <laughs> you know, I, I was like pissed off. And, and, I, and she, she knew me well enough to know. She said, okay, I'll call you later. And she hung up. <laughs> And then I stepped back and I went, you know, that was not the appropriate way to deal with anybody. Uh, so I castigated myself. But, 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 but a little bit later, I sort of calmed down. Around 2 o'clock, she calls me back and I said, well, you know, you know what's going to happen when you're here. Um, and she said, this is what she tells me. She said that Sunday, she had gone with her youngest son to the grocery store, was walking back. These two white men in a pickup truck, half the pickup truck, got on the sidewalk. They spat on her, used the N-word, and basically said, go back to where you came from. 
packed her bags, took the boys, came back to New York City. She says, you know, I will any day deal with him, but I cannot deal with that. And the lesson was, a lot of times when we are working with survivors, it becomes easy to see safety through that one lens, which is the lens of gender. The trouble is safety is more complicated than that. It, and for people who have been marginalized in many different ways, we have to understand the totality of that. And that is really what this concept actually gets to. And so we have to understand for all of us what the ways in which we all have privilege and access. We all do. If you go back, if you think you are the most oppressed person in the whole wide world, I suggest to you, go to Burger King. You know, they have those little kitty crowns. Put it on your head and say, I am the most oppressed person. Because the reality is we all have ways in which we have access to privilege. And so, yes, it's possible that in the dominant culture, these are all the ways in which you know, privilege, you know, it's English is the primary language. And, you know, those of us who do this work, we actually don't say white anymore. It's the concept of whiteness because it's the continuum of that. Because there is some work coming out in the U.S. that the darker you are, the quicker juries convict you and the longer is your jail sentence. So it's really the continuum that then gives you, because, you know, the concept white hasn't been uh, fixed either. How many of you have Irish ancestry? Let me tell you, those English people didn't think you were white anyway, so, you know. Uh, but, but it's important to understand that these are all concepts we have developed. And so what matters is you have to look at where you, your privilege comes from. Look, the fact that I speak English, and for the longest time I actually spoke the Queen's English, not anymore, um, you know, gives me access. The fact that I, you know, when I don't get my way, all I have to do is to say, this is Dr. Warrior immediately. Oh, Maya, please sit. What can I do for you? You know, I know what I'm doing. And the fact that I grew up in a middle class household does give me privilege and access. And that's important. Or, you know, whether I practice the religion or not, it doesn't matter. When I work with South Asians, I have to be very cognizant that Hindus, who are the majority, have destroyed Muslims, have destroyed the Sikh. You know, it's not that I don't. But remember, Observation is a two-way street. As much as I am, they are too. And you have to recognize privilege when you have it. And to say that I don't or feel guilty about it doesn't get anywhere. You know, in this line of work, you are going to offend. I'm just telling you. And if you don't like it, too bad. You are going to offend, and that's what you, you have to remember. And it's what you do after you offend that makes the difference. To say that I don't want to offend somebody, that's like copping out, in my opinion. That's my opinion. But we have to remember also that privilege creates the mechanisms for domination. And actually, domination begins with those lies, untruths, misinformation that you get all over the place. And that when we think about gender-based violence, which is the way the UN actually thinks about it, I know we work in DV or SA, but people experience it on a continuum. That you can start with female feticide, which is very common in many communities where girls are not wanted, all the way to femicide. And that siloing the issues are detrimental to those who come to us. You know, I could be an incest survivor, have faced gang rape, and then I'm in a domestic violence, you know, I'm in an abusive relationship. The past does inform my help seeking. And it's important to sort of remember that. We often forget, but it's, that's the thing that you have to remember broad based. Because the thing is, patriarchy that drives this, and I know we don't use that word anymore as much as we don't use the F word, which is feminism, by the way. Uh, but it is important to keep that in mind. That patriarchy drives how gender is thought about and understood. And you, will not, you wouldn't have patriarchy if you didn't have racism. You know, it's fascinating reading English stuff because what the English, how the English saw their women is how they saw Irish men and the men of the countries they were conquering. The women, Irish women, and women in those communities were completely invisible to them. They got the race class factors. We struggle with it. Conquerors actually get it easier. We have to also come to a point where we understand one will, you cannot get rid of one without getting rid of the others. You have to work 
together on all of this. And so a lot of times we tend to think, oh my God, X community kills their women in a certain way. Oh, it's all these cultural factors. You know, what that does is it's not only giving us misinformation, but it also keeps on reproducing the negative stereotypes that are out there. When things cross national borders, they get misinterpreted and they lose out on the historical context that has been driving that. So what is important to remember is to contextualize that, those issues, because without that, we'll never understand why these things exist in a particular community. It's very easy to say, oh, that's a cultural practice, and it's a terrible, barbaric cultural practice, but it doesn't quite work that way. This is your everyday world. It is not like this at all. It's not so nice and orderly. But it is to create that order that, in, at least in the US, we have all of these institutions of social management, including domestic and sexual violence programs, which are all controlled not only by the regulatory bodies, but also the economic systems. AS budgets fail, what gets asked? I was really shocked to hear yesterday that sexual assault prog programs have been cut. I'm like, what? And that is some of the, I mean, that is the most hidden form and the one women experience it the most. So it was kind of shocking to me, but it is driven by that. And then the question becomes, how do we manage those things? And I think I know yesterday Janice talked about it, even Terry talked about it. What's the language we are using? What forms do we use? How do our forms shape the ways in which we work with people? That's the culture of the organization. The language we use makes a big difference in how we, I mean, I know that in the US, I can't speak for Canada, when somebody calls in, the form is a 10-page form. So if you're spending your, you know, going through, what's your name, this, that, and when I tell people, can you go from question one to 50 to 25 to 30, they actually think I haven't taken my meds for the day. Uh, so, which is possible, but anyway. We don't see things as we are, you know, as they are. We see things as we are. Because those are the limits of the lens we have. So these are the assumptions you have to keep in mind, that every cultural group is contradictory. There are many people who believe domestic violence is perfectly fine, others who don't believe that. The people who don't believe that are not coming to you. And that, remember, each person who comes to you is also unique, and it's their multitude of identities that shape what it is that they want. And that just because someone looks like you, talks like you, walks like you, dresses like you, smells like you, it doesn't mean they think like you. This is the biggest slippery slope I've seen. People will say, oh, you're South Asian. Here, go talk to the South Asian counselor. I don't want to talk to anybody. I remember the first time we started in Manavi, and somebody called us, and... We were like, oh, hey, here we are. We're for South Asian women. And she was like, I don't want to talk to you. I'm like, why? You want to go to those white people? They don't know anything. Why do you want to go there? Talk to me. And she's like, no, I don't want to talk to you. Why can't you get that into your head? And it was a big shocker that people don't actually want to do that. But it is, it is something that we have to recognize, that all people don't want to talk to people who look like them. But, it, but you have to also look at how our policies really shape the ways in which we do this work. And uh, I'm not going to uh, sort of read the entire code, but it really is important that we get comfortable with contradictions and not knowing, and it's okay not to know. That's when it becomes clear that we create all of these structures because it makes us feel comfortable. You know, it, it's very funny. For all the work I do, you have to know that I read romance novels. I, I've been a feminist for a long, long time, from the time I was 16 years old, not knowing what that word meant. But uh, I read them, but I read only Victorian romances because modern day romances, I can't, I, two pages, I'm like, okay, this is going to be abusive, there's no point reading this. But Victoria is 1800, who cares, right? But, and I also read all the junkie magazines. I can tell you right now who's doing what with whom. Okay, so, uh, but, but, you know, the thing is, people are like, okay, you're a feminist, you shouldn't be reading all that. Who says so? I got caught because I wear lipstick, and I said, okay, I'm a lipstick feminist. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, but, but, the, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through this very quickly. But, you know, our systems, I mean, when uh, uh, she was talking, it really cr struck me that the ways in which our systems are completely fragmented and the ways we do our work. So, um, very quickly, this is, it, it's a criminal system that we are looking at in the U.S. But there are all of these specializations 
and there are special people assigned. So each event becomes a separate case. We have Rachel and her two kids, who I'm going to make white, middle-class, heterosexual for now. And uh, this is the way in which arrest works. Each system has its particular way of working. This is child protection. This is housing. This is orders for protection. This is custody. And this is what we do to a woman's life. Right? This is what we end up doing to somebody. Not understanding how she is a human being and her kids are functioning. So, you know, it's really taking a good hard look at what is it that you're doing and why. So in the end, you really have to be aware of what your own stuff is. We all make assumptions. Assumptions by themselves are not necessarily bad. It's how you challenge them that makes the difference. If you can do this, the rest of what I have to say doesn't matter. But this is the hardest. I do this work. My biases are like six-inch binders, thick four. I just happen to know what they are. And every time I get caught, it's like, oops. You probably go, why, why did you call her to do this? But it's important to recognize that we all have them. <laughs> Whether you are the top dog in your organization or the bottom dweller, when someone comes to you, you have power over them. You have to understand that. It doesn't matter. And then all the other powers that your identity gives you. Listen, listen, listen. It takes your heart, mind, ears, and eyes to actually truly listen. And a lot of times, we don't use the heart and the mind. It's only the, maybe the ears. It also is understanding what a person's own interpretation is of their own culture. It's not looking at what the broad base is and trying to fit people in. Talk to them. Who are you? Who do you talk to? Who have you talked to? Who can you talk to? What has happened when somebody you've talked to has responded in a certain way? Always come from a strength-based approach. And... You all know this, but what I want to get to is this. In the end, you, the UN actually recognizes that you cannot use culture to justify oppression towards anybody. It's very, very clear. But the question then is, what do you do? I mean, you cannot say, oh, those are their practices. We have no business going in there and saying anything. That's in the line of child abuse, child sexual abuse, incest, child... Um, rape, sexual assault, trafficking, domestic violence, any of those things. To say that it's their practice is, is copping out. But to also say, well, you know, this is the way it is, therefore you have to do it this way, is, it's really how you negotiate. And that is an art in itself. To say, look, these are not acceptable values, but I need to understand where you're coming from so that we can together make a difference. And the person who really has done this work really well is an African-American law professor by the name of Isabella Gunning, who mostly does her work on uh, FGM, or female genital mutilation. And one of the things she says is that when you are confronted with practices that challenge you, stop Ask yourself, what do you share in common with somebody? There are things you share, there are things you don't. Because when you look at somebody arrogantly, it's much harder to guess, get past that. And I'm going to give you a very short little story. How many of you know the practice of dowry? You know, dowry is when you, uh, money is given to the man's side because the value of women is less. It's a, it's a practice in India. And Connie Chung, the CBS, had this big special on dowry debts. I'm interviewing for a job. This is my final interview with the president of the board in this very fancy restaurant that has more than one fork. And usually I don't do well under those circumstances. So I just about, so she sees me, she shakes my hand and goes, oh my God, you're an Indian. I was like, yes, I am. I mean, yeah, I am. What can I do? She says, I feel so sorry for you Indian women. So my immediate thought is I got the job, right? Because I was like, yes, she feels sorry. So she's just going to give me a job. Well, that's not what happened. What happened was the following. So I said, why do you feel sorry for us? She says, oh, you know, um, you poor Indian women are all burned to death. I said, yes, we're burned to death. And you poor American women are all shot to death. In the end, it's still death. But the method of death varies. So what are you going to do? Well, I'll make a long story short. Ten minutes, this goes on, and this is what I do to her. 
I look at her and I said, yes, it's too bad that for a developed nation like the U.S., you haven't figured out how to get rid of your women. And us in a developed nation has figured it out. Because, listen, these things happen in the kitchen. You know, we don't have your fancy stoves. We have those, like, those camp stoves that you have to pump, and you don't pump it right. And whoosh, this is all polyester. <laughs> Goes up in flames. What are you going to do? So she's burned, and so there's nothing. There are no bullets, no guns, no fingerprints, nothing. It happened in the kitchen. And if you have a second and third degree burns, and you are in the hospital, you're in La La Land, whatever you call it, doesn't count. And the other thing you have to understand, ma'am, is that because you are a capitalist nation, and I, I, it's too bad that you haven't figured this out, but look, um, if my, I have a son, you have a daughter, 20000 is going to cost you. Too bad you didn't raise her properly. Her place is in the kitchen. She didn't know how to function. Set her herself on fire. Too bad. Gone. Now, you, ha you have a daughter. It's going to cost you 40000 Same thing. I don't know what you, all of you are doing to raise your daughter so badly. She too is gone. Now, you have one. It's going to cost you 80. 80 plus 40 plus 20. I have $140,000 in the bank. Isn't that what capitalism is about? So, so she is sitting across from me, totally horrified. That this is going to be, you know, here I am advocating how to kill women, and I'm going to be the director of this program. I'm looking at her and saying, you're going to be my boss. Somebody's not going to be alive at the end of this. It's not me. <laughs> but this story illustrates this point. When we talk, look, there are practices that will challenge you across the board everywhere. But what is important for us to understand, it's there, it's here. It's there. If when we come across as being very arrogant or say, oh my God, you barbaric people, there is no pathway forward. It's a dead end. And that is what we have to avoid in this work. So remember, our struggle is for a fundamental change in social relationships rather than for a per community quota of representations in the parliament of race and ethnicities. We are engaged in politics, linking theories with practices, examining ideologies through our lives and our lives through revolutionary ideas. You're not shopping in the market for cultural differences. I don't know, you know she's Canadian, right? So that's what we need to remember because in the end, it may seem utopian, but we must recover our capacity for dreaming. And you do need a new paradigm to understand this. And so when you think about the linkages, you heard Terry yesterday, she linked on how we need to think about you know, the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. You saw how, it trans how that actually works out in the life of Ramon and all the other missing and murdered women and sort of the links to how we then look at the LBGTQ, LBGTQII, that's how it is right now in the US through Janus. And so it's really taking all of this and then for you to figure out how do you go forth and multiply. Not literally, just, okay, so. Okay, and thank you all. You are a wonderful audience and uh, continue the great work.